This is Les Wilgis from the Department of Commerce, U.S. Commercial Service. This webinar, titled Poland, Familiarization to Export, is one of six country-specific webinars hosted by the U.S. Commercial Service St. Louis office, giving you a general overview of doing business in each country. The St. Louis office is one of over 100 domestic offices, in addition to another 100-plus offices in over 80 countries. Our mission is to help U.S. companies by providing export counseling and assist with finding qualified agents and distributors overseas. If you aren't working with your local U.S. commercial service, set up a meeting to discuss your company's goals overseas and how the organization may be able to assist. You can find us at www.export.gov. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide an overview of doing business in Poland. You will first hear from Margaret Gottlieb from the St. Louis office for just a few minutes before the main presentation from Brenda Van Horn, our main speaker. Margaret Gottlieb has been an international trade specialist with the Commercial Service since 1997. She will take just a few minutes to give an overview of the Commercial Service itself and its benefits to our export partners. Margaret. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining us uh, for our uh, webinar with with Poland today. I'd like to uh, just talk a little bit about the the commercial service on the domestic side and and things that we can uh, do from you uh, for you. Uh, our main uh, mission is to protect and to promote American business interests all over the world, and we do that in a, a wide variety of ways. Uh, we try to meet with you, see what you're doing here and how you're doing it. And uh, then uh, we can find out how we might help you to export your product and where to export your product overseas. We have about 100 offices uh, nationwide in mostly uh, major cities. Uh, we also have uh, a lot of offices overseas in almost every country that we can do business uh, with. And we work uh, w with the, the staff in those offices. The offices or directors are Americans, but all of the, the staff that we work with um, are foreign nationals that not only speak English because they're working with U.S. companies, but they speak the language of the country that they're in, which is very helpful uh, when they contact industry associations, potential clients for you, and other government agencies. Uh, to work with you, uh, and they, uh, unlike a lot of the trade specialists on the domestic side, they have a, a specific industry portfolio that they work with, so therefore they, we consider them uh, specialists in, in those industries as, as well. Some of the main things that we do um, is we uh, counsel with you, we uh, assess your export readiness, we help you to identify key markets if you haven't already done so, we do a lot of market research. Um, we do the matchmaking through several programs that we have. And if need be, um, we can get involved with uh, commercial uh, d diplomacy in uh, when you're bidding on foreign contracts or, or the like. Uh, we can advocate for you through our advocacy department in, in Washington, D.C. So the main thing is to, to realize that we, we try to get to know you, not because we're we're just nosy government people, but we get to know you because we have a theory. You don't know what you don't know until you don't know it, and we try to get you to know what you need to know so that you're successful in your uh, business endeavors overseas. And this all then helps to strengthen your business, to strengthen the U.S. economy, and to create and sustain jobs uh, for real people. One of the things that we ask you to do, and it's a very important form for us, is uh, in order to keep us in business, we have to show Congress that we're really doing something out here with that appropriated funds that they give us so that we can help you. And this is a client exporter verification of successful outcomes. We'll provide you with this form occasionally so that you can list on there uh, the assistance, their drop-down boxes, assistance provided, uh, the, uh, the outcome achieved, whether it was a sale or distributor signed, uh, the country, and if you choose to do so, uh, an export dollar value, and to sign that form so that we can report those results in aggregate. We never um, use that the, the name of the company or your buyer or distributor unless, us, you, unless you give us permission to do so. 
So um, I would like now to hand it back uh, to our, our moderator, Les Wilgus, my colleague here in St. Louis, uh, to introduce our featured speaker. Brenda Van Horn is currently serving as a commercial attache in Warsaw, Poland, arriving in December 2011 for a four-year tour of duty. She joined the U.S. Department of Commerce in February 2009 as a foreign commercial service officer assigned to the Export Assistance Center in Buffalo, New York. Prior to joining the commercial service, Ms. Van Horn worked as an international account manager, customer service manager international, and a senior sales associate international for consumer goods manufacturing and business-to-business manufacturing companies. She served as the liaison for global offices located in Western Europe, Canada, Japan, South Af- South America. She graduated with a BS in management from Houghton College, Houghton, New York. I would like to thank Ms. Van Horn for taking the time to join us and share her expertise today. Brenda. Okay, great. Well, hello, everybody, and thanks so much for joining this webinar. Um, this is uh, a little difficult for me because usually when I'm speaking, I'm used to seeing the audience uh, Reaction. So, um, without being able to see your faces, uh, I, I hope it doesn't get too flat here. But uh, we'll, I'll try to make it interesting for you. Um, so, yeah, you, you see my my bio there. I've uh, uh, had a number of years. I won't say how many. Um, working in international trade, uh, and I actually was a client uh, using all of the services that uh, Margaret was talking about earlier. Um, and using them successfully uh, to uh, to grow our international business before uh, finally kind of making the leap and, and coming over and joining the Foreign Service myself. So um, I kind of have worn both hats, uh, both as a customer and as a employee of the commercial service. And, and I got to tell you, it's 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 you know there's a cliche that we're the best kept secret in the in the government. And, I wish it wasn't a cliche. I wish everybody knew about us because I think what we do is, is really extremely helpful for, for businesses who are inter- interested in um, growing their international business. But anyway, enough of the uh, the promo ad here. Let's let's get right down to business. And I went the wrong way. Okay, I'll go the other way. There we go. Okay, business opportunities in Poland. Um, all right, this is not a joke. <laughs> We're going to give a real brief 1,000-year history of Poland here. And I'll get to the reasons why this is important as we go forward in the in the presentation. Um, the first one, uh, Poland is established in the year 966 as an independent Christian nation. Um, it was during this year that they actually fought off the invading hordes uh, coming up from the from the east and um, basically saved uh, Europe from um, yeah, the the crazy people that were coming in, and, and they'll tell you that, that they saved Europe. Uh, around the year 1500, um, Poland had reached its political and military zenith. There's actually, I don't know if you were watching the pictures as they were scrolling through before we started here, but there's a, a, a giant statue in the old town here in Warsaw of a, a king. He's standing on this big pedestal, and he's holding this sword. He's King Zygmunt, and um, it said that he was the king who inherited a kingdom of wood and turned it into a kingdom of stone. Um, and this was during the 1500s. He, he uh, really expanded the borders, um, made it a big trading partner, really kind of consolidated uh, Poland as a country. And then after that, it all started to go downhill. And by the year 1795, uh, Poland was actually off the map. Uh, and there's a really interesting website, if, you, if you're ever so inclined to, to look for it, where it shows the map of Europe uh, every 100 years from year zero to the current time. And if you kind of click through, you can see how the, the borders change. And when you hit 17, you know, the 1800s, there's no Poland. Uh, because during that time, Germany, Austria, and Russia had basically partitioned it into three sections, and it was gone. And it wasn't uh, until over 100 years later, during the after World War One and the Treaty of Versailles, reestablished Poland. Um, it's because of that, that that Poles actually have a really favorable view of American uh, people, of America as a nation and, and our our country in general, um, because of our work in you know helping them to become reestablished as a country. 
And, of course, all of that changed in 1939 when, you know, Germany invaded and World War II uh, began. And I, I have to really mention World War II here because um, it, it's still a very big presence in this country. Uh, in fact, just earlier uh, last week on August 1st uh, was the um, anniversary of the Polish uprising at the end of the war. Uh, they, they tried to fight back against the Germans, and unfortunately, it, it didn't end well. Um, they had anticipated help arriving from Russia. It didn't happen. They fought bravely for 63 days uh, when they had anticipated Russia coming in after three days and, and helping them. Um, it, it, the bottom line is, is that it, it basically disseminated the city of Warsaw uh, as retaliation for their um, uprising. The Germans leveled the city, and uh, the citizens were, were killed in huge numbers and, and had to flee. And um, it wasn't until just recently, uh, within the last couple of years, that the, no, the population number for the city of Warsaw finally reached its pre-war peak. Um, so it, it took several generations to get over what happened in, in that time frame. Um, it, and on August 1st, on the, uh, the anniversary of the uprising beginning, um, there's actually a, a moment of silence where the entire city of Warsaw, and I, by entire city I mean the buses, the trams, the cars, people working in offices, everyone, for one minute at 5 o'clock, everything stops, and everybody observes a, a moment of silence to remember those people. So um, just some kind of important things to, to know about this country if you are coming here. Uh, that, you know, that those things are important to the people. Um, and then, unfortunately, what happened is, is in 1945, uh, one of the reasons why the, the, the Russians didn't come and, and help uh, with that uprising is because they knew that they were going to want to take over Poland, and the people that were fighting the uprising would be the very same people that would give them trouble in taking over the country, and, and so they, they didn't come in to help. Um, and indeed, that's exactly what happened. They took over. And most of us who, who uh, came of age, uh, you know, during the 80s and so on, and we all have this vision of Poland as being kind of this gray, dull, dark place. Um, it's, it's not like that anymore. It, it definitely has changed since the 1980s uh, solidarity movement in, in which, uh, you know, the Lech Walesa movement um, kind of, fought back and gained power, and in 1989, they actually won elections and forced out the communists, and, and Poland emerged as a free democratic nation. Um, you know, sometimes we have to remind ourselves that even though this is a really old country, it's a really young uh, uh, government. It's really only been about 20, now about 25 years old. So. Uh, there's still a lot of growth going on here in, in that respect. There's still a lot of maturity that needs to be reached, but we'll, we'll go on to that more. Um, in 1999, Poland joined NATO, and they still are very much a, a major partner to the United States, having fought, uh, their soldiers fought side by side with Americans in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and in fact, there was just something in the news yesterday that uh, a soldier from Poland who had been wounded in Iraq passed away, and, and uh, that increased their number of soldiers that have, have died in that conflict. Um, and then in 2004, they joined the European Union. So uh, that, in a nutshell, is our, our very brief history. And I'm going to tell you now why that's important, that I always start my presentations with, with that kind of information. Um, first of all, identity. Uh, you know. Over those thousand years, they've been invaded, they've been uh, conquered, you know, they've, they've, they've lived under communism, they've lived under, you know, Nazi Germany. And because of that, though, you know, they, they managed to maintain their language, they managed to maintain their, their traditions, and they, you know, they, they have a real sense of, of pride in, in what they managed to do, even through all that adversity. Um, so... It's important that, you know, I mentioned all those things so that, that you're aware of that background when you're, when you're dealing with polls. Um, things that we kind of take for granted, they had to struggle for. Uh, 
and then that ties into the relationship part of it. Um, they do take a little bit of time to um, warm up to you, you know. And as Americans, we're so used to, you know, kind of bounding in the room and, you know, big smiles and handshakes and, and you know, talking to everybody. And um, it, it's not like that in Poland. And so when you, you know, if you decide to come here and, and you'll first arrive and you'll think that things aren't going well or that people aren't treating you very well or, the, you know, that they don't seem to be very receptive, that's not the case at all. They're just a little reserved, and it takes a while for them to, to warm up to people. It, you know, and kind of to that point, I have to tell a little funny story. Um, the last time I was back in the States, uh, back in April, I was uh, in a store, and I, I wasn't in, a, in my hometown. I was, I was in another state, and I couldn't figure out why everybody kept acting like they knew me. And then all of a sudden I remembered I'm not in Poland anymore. People in America smile at strangers. They, they don't do that here. <laughs> so it, it kind of, uh, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a cultural difference that you just should be aware of. And, and don't take it the wrong way. Um, it, they're just very formal. And then um, I also want to mention the Roman uh, Catholic religion because, as I mentioned, that started their country in 966. Uh, you know, they, they recognized the Pope. They, um, you know, they, they, made Poland a Christian nation, and right now, to date, uh, Poland is about 95% Catholic, and it, it's a really high percentage of that 95% practice. Um, so there is a number of religious holidays throughout the year that businesses will close down. So it, it, if you do decide to come into this market and you're making plans to visit, um, please check our website for uh, national holidays because there will be a number of days that you think, you know, the country should be open for business and they won't be. Um, and I'll just give you an example of that. August 15th uh, is, uh, is, a, is a Catholic holiday. It's a, it's a Roman Catholic holiday. And all businesses will be closed in Poland. And because of that, uh, the way it falls on a Thursday Pretty much no one will be at work on Friday either. It's definitely going to be a, a very slow uh, two days there. Um, and, and, again, that will happen at several times throughout the year uh, as they celebrate those holidays. So, so those are kind of the reasons why I gave you a little bit of the background, um, just so that you have some situational awareness uh, of, of the, uh, the country itself before we actually get into the market conditions. Okay. So... Why Poland? Um, I guess the, in one word I could sum it up and say because of the people. Um, if you are considering a new market, uh, you know, you should consider Poland because of, number one, uh, the labor force here uh, has an extremely strong work ethic. Uh, they're, they're actually more college educated than in the U.S. And it's, it's interesting. I just had a conversation about this with the um, Minister for Regional Development, who actually thought this was not a, a great thing because she said what's happening is we have so many uh, people with MBAs and, and engineering degrees and so on that we're starting to lose the, the, the worker bees. Uh, you know, we need people with more technical skills. Um, and, and so one of the things that they're thinking about doing is actually putting some money into more technical um, types of education uh, because people are starting to lose those those skills that uh, they normally would acquire because of their high education levels. Um, English uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, actually, I have to tell you, the best Polish that I spoke was the day I arrived in country, having coming out of uh, several months of intensive Polish language training. It has gone steadily downhill since then because everybody here speaks English, and as soon as I try to talk to them in, in my very poor Polish, they immediately switch to English, and, and by everyone I mean shopkeepers, taxi drivers, everyone. They, you know, they, especially if you're in a bigger city, um, like in Warsaw, you, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who doesn't speak English. Um, so, so there's, you know, definitely some ease of doing business because of that. Now, when you get out into some of the smaller cities and out into the rural areas, uh, not so much. But, you know, if you stick into the cities. Um, you're going to have an easy time with it. And, and then, again, the, there's a, a lot of low wage rates in, in this area. Now, 
if you want to sell your products here, don't let that discourage you because even though the, the, the wage rates are lower than in the EU, everything else is lower too. Um, there is a low cost of living here. So comparatively speaking, it's still a pretty good market for, for U.S. products. Um, in fact, domestic consumption is, is, is on the rise, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later in this presentation. Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out, uh, again, referencing the fact that this country is, is fairly young, this, this government. Uh, in 2011, the rank, uh, the World Bank rank of doing business, the ease of doing business, was um, 74. It jumped almost 20, 20 spots to 55 in 2012, um, and we really don't anticipate it going backwards. We think it'll, it'll continue to get uh, better. The, the lower the number is, the better it is. Um, Poland is doing a lot to try to um, change, you know, they, they, they're they gradually switching from a communist style of government and market to a free market economy. Um, and there's still some issues, but as you can see by the way this ranking is going, they're, they're working through those fairly quickly. Um, just a quick slide about location. This is important for anyone who is considering maybe Eastern Europe uh, or Central Europe as a whole. What, what we're starting to see as a trend here is that people who want um, distribution in the entire area, especially this, this area down below where Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, that, that whole area, um, a lot of times they'll start with Poland. Um, and then branch out into those other areas. And, and this is actually a really good strategy because among their neighbors in the region, Poland is really seen as, as, as kind of a leader, um, definitely like a big brother sort of figure. I mean, they're the first ones who, who uh, emerged as a free market economy. Um, you know, they're, they're one of the first in this region to join the EU. Um, you know, they're, they're definitely one of the largest countries. Uh, in terms of population. So, so they're definitely, they, they fill some very strong leadership roles here. Um, and so I don't want to say they dictate policy or, or, or even set it in any way at all, but the other countries do watch to see what Poland's doing. And that goes for market trends. Um, talking a little bit about place, you know, we talked about the, the, the link, and this is important. Um, not only the neighbors that are in the central and, and eastern part, but they also still maintain relations with um, Russia, with Ukraine, uh, and, and some of the other countries in that area. Uh, and a lot of times, um, um, Americans in particular will have trouble going into those areas. Maybe the English uh, language is, is not as, as strong. But if you have a good Polish distributor, he can make that leap for you. Uh, let's see what else. A little bit about um, American businesses that are here. Uh, Poland has emerged in part because of their strong language skills and high educational levels uh, as, a, as a really good place for American businesses who are investing in things like call centers, um, back office operations, and uh, also research and development centers. And um, what we're seeing is that the, the, these, they're not putting these uh, – these are global companies who – are not changing anything that they're doing in the States, but they need a, a strong partner in Europe to handle their, their European um, business or, or calls or things like that. And Poland has kind of emerged as, as a natural place for that type of business. Uh, there are still plans to join the Eurozone, uh, that is to use the, the Euro as their currency, but quite frankly, um, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, uh, although the government officially is, is still saying that they are going to be doing it. They had originally thought it would be in 2015. I've been reading lately that it's probably not going to happen until maybe 2020. Um, no one really knows for sure, but part of the reason why their economy has, has weathered the, the storm of the last recession is because they weren't on the Eurozone. So I, I, I just don't see them going to it you know, anytime really soon. They're still using the Polish Wadi. And this picture here I want to point out to you is uh, actually this is in the Old Town, um, and I think uh, Les had well in his presentation. A really interesting place. Um, you, you know, you heard me tell you earlier that uh, Warsaw was decimated, and in fact, uh, I think the number is 85% of their buildings were leveled. And so you're looking at this, and you're probably thinking, yeah, but these buildings look really old, right? Like, where did they come from? 
Um, and if you don't know the story, I'll tell you that after World War II, the Poles, because they are a very determined and proud people who value their identity, uh, recreated their old town based on paintings, pictures, and existing drawings that they could find. Um, they actually went and found, you know, bricks and things from other cities and brought them into Warsaw and rebuilt the old town to look exactly as it had before the war. So these buildings that you're looking at were really built in the late 40s and early 50s, um, even though they, they look quite old. And if you go here and you walk around, it's, it's kind of amazing. They, you really do feel like you're in an old European city. Okay, um, back to business. So it's, we just found this slide really interesting. It's, uh, it shows the GDP growth in Europe uh, during those recessionary years between 2008 and 2011. And you can see there's lots of low numbers, negative numbers. And then, you know, up here we see Poland in, in double digits, uh, you know, 15.8% during the, that, that uh, stretch there, that uh, three or four year period. Um, they grew. They grew a lot. And it's, it's really, you know, the success story of Europe. Maybe wondering why that happened. Well, uh, the answer is in the fourth bullet point here. Um, they actually were the largest recipient of uh, EU aid. Um, it's, it's called cohesion funds. And basically it's money that the EU gives to its newest and, and younger, uh, more emerging democracy kind of members who... Um, need help to get their company, their country up to the same standards as the rest of Europe. And this definitely, uh, having this infusion of cash definitely helped Poland uh, weather the recession. Um, but it wasn't the only part, and, and we'll talk some more about that. Um, they, they have a, you know, a, a fairly large population base, uh, 38.2 million Poles, uh, which is a good deal of the EU population. Um, but they're relatively young. And those who, who have left the country to, to, in 2004 when they joined the EU, they were able to, to move freely about. And I think because they weren't able to for so many years, a lot of people did leave in, in that first uh, wave. Um, and what happened is they, they left for jobs in, in other countries, and they sent that money back to Poland, a, a good deal of it. What we're starting to see is a trend of a lot of those people now coming back. Um, and, you know, they've gone to school, they've gained work experience, and now they're, they're back here in, in Poland and, and ready to, to settle down. In fact, we, we just uh, brought somebody into our office to work on a, a temporary basis uh, to fill out for somebody who was on leave. And she is one of these people. Her and her husband um, left when they were very young, and now they're, they're both back. They're both professionals. Uh, they both wanted to return to Poland to raise their family, and, you know, here they are. So... Uh, even though people did leave in, in quite a big wave, it, it's kind of nice to see that, uh, you know, they're coming back and, and helping Poland grow. Um, pretty good uh, GDP growth. Uh, and then, again, uh, because Poland is a member of NATO, uh, there's some, some huge opportunities in the, the military side for American businesses. To give you an idea, this is the, the number of structural funds that Poland did receive between 2007 and 2013. Um, it, it's, of course, the largest amount here. It, it's substantially larger. And um, it, it was just announced the new uh, round of funding, which will be the final round that Poland will be eligible for. Uh, they will actually get another... Uh, 72.4 um, billion euros, and that's going to start coming in in 2014. And uh, interesting to know, uh, as I mentioned, I met earlier this week with the Minister of Regional Development who administers these funds, and she told us that um, not only did Poland get the largest amount of money during this first round, um, but as a country, they actually had the lowest error rate in how those funds were applied and um, and used, which I found very interesting. Uh, she was quite proud of this number, as she should be. Uh, one thing that, that I have been telling people is that Poland actually used these funds for the purpose that they were intended for. Um, there was very little corruption or, or graft involved. They actually used them to, you know, build their infrastructure, um, educate their population, uh, you know, create new opportunities for their citizens, 
and we're starting to see the the results of that. And it was it was interesting to hear her talk about it because she she's confirming what what we had already gathered from our intelligence that um, you know they they did indeed uh, put these funds to good use. And I might add that um, American businesses uh, really uh, benefited as well because they have been bidding on a lot of the projects and tenders that came about because of this. Um, and, and basically what they've done, and I'll show you uh, on this map with the major cities, is all of these cities that are listed here, every one of them has a new airport. And that new airport uh, needed a lot of products and um, things like, you know, you think of airports and you think of airplanes. Okay, but they also need fire trucks and they also need, you know, chairs in the, in the lobby and they also need all sorts of technical equipment and, and um stuff for security and, you know, you name it, uh, there's an American business that, that touched some part of it. So a um, lot of huge opportunities there. And, in fact, uh, transportation infrastructure is one of our top prospects um, because even though, you know, most of the major cities have now been upgraded with their airport services, there's still a lot of work to be done in some of the second-rate cities, the second tier. And there's a lot of... Um, need for infrastructure between cities as well. The, the roads and the railroads still need some, some upgrading. So um, that next round, round of fun will start to address some of those other issues. Um, a little bit about the government. Uh, the, the current government, the, the prime minister is Donald Tusk. Uh, he's actually been in, in power now for a second term, which is really important because uh, He's the first leader since the fall of communism to actually be reelected, which kind of shows some stability in the in the country. Um, he's a little bit on shaky ground now. There was some talk that he might not be reelected again, but uh, it looks like it's, it's stabilizing, which which is good because he has a very pro business um, approach, and uh, there's been a lot of um, industry privatization under his his watch, which is helpful for the economy overall. That. Okay. Uh, okay. Taking a break, and let's talk a little bit about the challenges here. Um, as I mentioned, the, the poor infrastructure. I actually, I was looking at this slide earlier today, and, and I think that we're going to change this from poor to fair. I think we, we should upgrade this a little bit because they have done some major things to help it. The, the airports are now much better. Um, they just did some uh, deep water dredging in the in the harbor, so that uh, in Gdansk, so that more ships can come in through the port. Um, there's some new railroads that are being built, uh, actually, again, between Gdansk and Warsaw. Now, we'll not have a high-speed rail. There is one between Warsaw and Krakow, which is helping uh, that, that line. Um, roads are still a bit of a problem, although we did have the Euro 2012 here last year, and, and that helped the road situation tremendously because they were trying to get those roads in place for people who were traveling from Germany into some of the southern cities in Warsaw. So there's a pretty good um, uh, highway uh, now that runs across the lower part of Poland and one that runs across the upper part of Poland uh, that, that goes east to west. North to south, there's still some issues, but and, you know, those are expected to be um, taken care of soon. I would like to caution anybody who's coming to visit, though, that if you're planning on driving, it will take a lot longer than a comparable distance will in the states um, because the, you know there, there really just isn't the same um, uh, highway interstate system that we have in, in America. Um, a lot of the highways still are two lanes, uh, you know, one in each direction, and so it, things do take a lot longer. Um, there is still some issues with the labor code. Uh, I'm dealing with it right now in that I've got a staff of 12, and every one of them has to take two weeks consecutive uh, to, to for their leave uh, at one point during the year. So I've got a lot of people out of the office for extended periods of time, um, and, and that's the law. They have to do it. So, you know, just be aware that there's some issues in that. Um, also, speaking of time off, uh, Poland is very similar to the rest of Europe in that don't try to do business. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing this, this webinar right now because it's, it's a very slow time for business. Everybody leaves. They leave the cities. They go out into the country. They take their, their, their vacations. 
Um, but it'll come back with a bang in September, and everyone will be right back to business as usual. Uh, one issue that, that we have been having since I've been here, and, and this is actually a pretty big issue, is, is there's a lack of industry advisory boards. Um, so a lot of times the government will change regulations or laws um, without consultation of what, that, what their changes might actually do to the industry. And this has created some heartburn, and I, I would say across the board. It, it doesn't really single out any one particular industry. It's, it's, it's been an issue that, that we've been trying to address here um, with some limited success, but it is still definitely one of the challenges. And another challenge is the, uh, the tender and the procurement process. Um, it still favors the lowest price, and, and that's still a bit of a communist hangover. Uh, that they, they feel like you have to have the lowest price uh, regardless of what the consequences of that is. And, and we like to call it the illusion of the low price here um, because, you know, you get what you pay for and, and, and quality is important. Uh, interestingly, I just read a statistic that said that they are now starting to say that, well, they want quality more than, than cheap price, but haven't really seen that translate into the, the procurement process yet. Again, it's a challenge. We're working through it. Um, it, it can be overcome. So if anybody has uh, taken a moment to look at our country commercial guide for Poland, um, our best prospects for 2013 are listed there. And they each, each of these sectors that you see on the screen, it will go into um, uh, in-depth information on each one. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, on, uh, talking about each one in particular, although there are a few that I'll mention in, in the next few slides. Um, energy is, is huge. Uh, and the reason why it's huge is, is Poland has a problem in that over 90% of their current electricity capacity is coming from coal-fired power plants. And of those plants, um, almost half of them are more than 30 years old. And from personal experience, that in the winter here, it, it's hard to breathe uh, because there's so much, the air is dirty. Um, it's not like you know, some of the pictures you see coming out of China where people have to wear masks, but it, it, is, it is bad and it is something that they need to address. And the Polish government knows that they need to address this and they actually have, in order to continue to receive those EU funds, um, they have to reach certain emission targets. And w one of those targets is, is that they have to have their energy diversified with no more than 30% um, in any one industry. And so what that's done is it's created a lot of opportunity for American business, uh, both in nuclear um, and all of the renewable energies uh, with, with wind and biogas being um, particularly good sectors. And we're also seeing uh, a, a really good sector that, that's up and coming is, is uh, waste to energy um, because they also have some issues with cleaning up their landfills and and some of the other um, environmental issues. They can kind of take care of both of those issues, waste and energy, if they find that technology. And this is, a, this is a, an American technology innovation, so some really good um, opportunities there for businesses who are in that sector. And then I had mentioned earlier about the NATO uh, connection, and um, I, I won't read this because I'm probably already boring you enough with all of this, but I'll just draw your attention to, in the third bullet, the last line, $45 billion U.S. dollars. That's huge. Um, between 2013 and 2022, uh, Poland expects to spend $45 billion to upgrade their, their military, uh, their army, their navy, their air force. Um, th there's just so many different areas that this touches on, and... You know, when you think military, you think of the big players like Raytheon and, and, and Lockheed Martin and, and some of the others, but really it, it's going to help American small business as well because all of those small businesses feed these larger companies, and, and you know, we, we just expect to see um, some, some huge opportunities uh, overall for, for American businesses in this area. That's, that's an awful lot of money. Um, we won't get all of it. You know, some there's a lot of countries that are vying for, for these uh, tenders, but we hope we get a good share of it. So um, they do uh, tend to be very receptive to American products, um, especially with the NATO uh, connection. There, there's some, you know, having systems that are interoperable is a, is a real plus. So 
again, if you want to have more information on this industry, uh, you can get our country commercial guide. There's lots of stuff in there on it. And the medical sector is another area that we just wanted to kind of focus in on because um, Poland is actually uh, right now a, a leader in medical tourism. Uh, again, we, we go back to that highly educated workforce. Uh, there's a lot of doctors here. Um, they do have a public health system, but it, it, their public health system has uh, had some issues, which has spawned a, a private system that's kind of grown up next to it. Um, so there's a lot of capacity here, and it, it's, it's because of the low cost of living, it's, it's fairly inexpensive. So there's a lot of opportunities for uh, American businesses who supply products and services to the medical sector to supply these uh, private hospitals, and even the public ones as well. And then some of our other best prospects, we talked a little bit about the transportation um, in power generation. Uh, Poland is, is, uh, has a mandate to replace all of their, their lines. Because they're changing all the way that the power is generated, they have to upgrade the lines, so they're putting in all smart grids. Um, there's uh, a lot of opportunities in the, the gaming software industries. Uh, franchising is huge. There's so many new American franchise companies coming in to the market. It seems like every day I see something new. Uh, Les, I seem to have lost connection. Maybe you can forward to the next. I'll try. I, I might have also. Okay, oh, there, there we you go. go. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this other than to tell you that numbers can be misleading, and I'll mention Delaware. <laughs> uh, according to this slide, there's hardly any American investment in Poland, but it's, it's really not true. Um, it's just like in America where a lot of corporations are incorporated in the state of Delaware, most of them are not located there. The same thing holds true in Europe. Um, a lot of American companies have their headquarters based in either Germany or Luxembourg, um, which show as two of the largest foreign direct investments in Poland. Um, they're actually a, the, the way that all of EU counts their foreign direct investment is based on where the, um, the investment dollars are coming from, in this case Germany or Luxembourg, even if it's an American company that's based in that country. So we happen to know, and, and the, the Polish agency that gave us this information has also told us, we know that it's actually American investment. Um, and they've also told us that they know there's about 140,000 Poles that are employed here by about 300 U.S. firms. Um, but what we're actually starting to see is that there's some uh, the bilateral investment. We're, we're actually seeing some Polish companies that have now reached a, a maturity level where they're starting to invest in America. So we're, we're seeing a real meshing of our, our, our trade uh, uh, flow between the two countries. And these are just some of the companies that, that are located that do have operations here. And here's some of our best exports to Poland. Um, the, the top number here, the civilian aircraft, that's actually the uh, the Boeing Dreamliner that Poland bought uh, seven or eight, I think eight altogether um, in 2011. The purchase agreement was signed. They're still delivering them. I think they've got four right now. Um, but that, that's a really large number that really drove up the, the number for uh, aircraft and made it the largest number on the list here. Um, I, I believe we have 2012 data yet, but I, I, we haven't upgraded this slide, and I'm not sure what it is. But this is still, it's still a fairly good snapshot of, of what's happening in the market. Um, just some advice for U.S. firms. This is pretty typical stuff no matter where you are. It's, it's just really good to have personal contact with the customer. Um, you know, face-to-face -face meetings are always great. Uh, you know, I won't go through a lot of this because a lot of it is just common sense and stuff to put in. Wherever you are, you're going to have to do this stuff. A um, few general business practices that are unique to Poland, though. Uh, they are very punctual. <laughs> Make sure you arrive on time for the meetings. Um, unlike uh, like Latin American countries, you know, time is a relative concept there. But in Poland, be on time. Um, they also have a really strong sense of hierarchy and, and authority. Um, you know, they, they want to make sure that the, the meeting is taking place between peers. So 
You know, if you're sending over the president of your company, they'll make sure that the president of their company meets with you and, you know, on down the line. Um, they do have a somewhat formal manner of, of speaking until, you know, so, so you, I guess what I want to say is um, don't start the meeting by saying, you know, hi, Lec, or hi, Bob, um, until you're asked to call somebody by their first name, address them as Mr. or Mrs., and, and you know, let them tell you, oh, no, call me, whatever, whatever it is. Um, you can use your English business cards. They don't have to be written in Polish, but it's always nice to learn a few basic Polish greetings. Uh, hello is, is uh, Dzień Dobry, which basically means good morning, but they use it all day long. Um, goodbye is do widzenia, which is basically, you know, good evening. And dziękuję is thank you. Um, you know, there won't be a test afterwards. You won't have to remember those. <laughs> but we'll help you. Um, and then uh, dressed in, in business attire, it, it is a, a more formal than in the U.S. Um, you would rarely see somebody come to a business meeting without having on a tie or, or uh, even in, in this hot weather that we're having right now, um, if it's a formal meeting, they will be wearing their suit jackets. Uh, I've lost one slide here. Uh, one other thing that I want to mention to you, um, if there's any women on the call, uh, when you extend your hand to be shipped, you know, to shake, uh, when you first meet somebody, do not be surprised uh, if, it, especially if it's an older Polish gentleman, if he kisses your hand. This is a very, very common uh, um, practice here in Poland, uh, and I actually think it's kind of a delightful cu uh, custom that they just have kept over the years. Um, don't expect that you have to kiss anybody back, though. <laughs> And I'm not really going to spend any time on these because uh, they were covered earlier. Just some of the things that, that we can help you with. Um, if, if you have any questions on the services of the commercial service, your, your Export Assistance Center can um, give you more information on those. And I do believe this presentation will be available to everybody um, if, who, who wants to see it, if you do want more information on some of this stuff. Um, let's do that. Here's our contact information. Um, Bill Tchaikovsky is our senior commercial officer in, in this office. Um, although he has a Polish name, he, he is an American, <laughs> and I'm the other, uh, the second American in the office. Uh, my contact information is there. And as was mentioned uh, at the start of this conference, um, we also have a staff of commercial specialists uh, here in, in Poland um, who are industry experts. and. Um, I am not using that term loosely. We have people in our office who have been here for 30 years. They know the industries that they work in. Um, they, they were here at the start. You know, they've seen them develop. They know the players. Um, you know, it, it, please don't hesitate to contact us if you are interested in coming into the market because their, their insights uh, are invaluable into, um, you know, helping businesses enter and, and, and work in this area. So I encourage you to uh, to keep our information handy here and, and reach out to us if you're interested in, in exporting to Poland. And one final slide we have here. This is actually the beautiful downtown Warsaw skyline. Um, the, the tall building with the spire is the, the Palace of Culture and Science. And uh, actually the, the building uh, just to the left is uh, – Newly built. In fact, they're just finishing it. Uh, so we're seeing lots of growth happening here in the capital. Um, and we hope you come to visit us. And I guess with that, Les, can we open it up for questions? Thanks, Brenda. And now for the question and answer portion of the program, we've referred to Margaret Gottlieb. Uh, thank you, Les. I do have one here. It's obviously, there are U.S. companies already exporting to Poland. There will no doubt be an increase of exports to Poland being an emerging market as it is, whether from the U.S. or other countries. What do you perceive as benefits to a company getting into this market sooner than later? Good. Um, well, it is it is growing. I have to tell you, I've been here two years, and we we were busy when I first got here, but we're really busy now. Um, the market is, is is exploding. I would say, don't wait. I mean, you, you know, there's always going to be opportunities, and there's always going to be new um, 
industries and new technologies that will create new opportunities. But I definitely have seen, even in the last 12 months, um, a, a growing interest in, in Poland um, overall. And I think part of it is attributable to the fact that they, they have kind of asserted themselves. They're becoming more um, visible in the press uh, with their leadership roles in the EU, um, with some of the, the stances that they've taken on various uh, legislation that's going on. And I think that that sort of um, kind of opened people's eyes to that this is not a communist country. This is a free market economy, and it's growing, and there's a lot of opportunities here. And so we are seeing, we're seeing an increase in the request for services for companies coming in here. So, you know, if you have any interest at all, I say, you know, explore the market now. Even if you decide that maybe the timing isn't right for your, for your company, you know, it's better to, to look into it now. How is fracking being accepted in Poland? Uh, the fracking question. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. Um, it, it's, it's being actually accepted a lot better here than uh, it is in the States. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, primarily, most of their gas uh, that they, they use has been coming from Russia. And, you know, there's this very difficult relationship with, with Russia, uh, you know, and, and so energy actually becomes a security issue. So if you look at it in terms of, um, well, you know, there is definitely this, this environmental issue that we've heard about, but on the other hand, we have this, this um, security issue. So being able to, to maybe not have to buy so much of their gas from, from Russia kind of outweighs the, the concerns that there might be for the, um, for the environment. So while there have been some small protests, we really haven't seen any large-scale, you know, national um, uh, protests against fracking. Uh, it, it has been very localized. Uh, now, having said that, um, the, 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 the gas situation itself while initially it was thought to be huge, um, it, it, as uh, just in the time that I've been here in, in uh, just about two years, uh, those estimates keep going down. And in fact, uh, a couple of the, the major players have actually left the market because they, they don't think it's, um, uh, it, it's not happening fast enough for them. They're not seeing a return on their investment. Uh, they do have to drill deeper than they thought they were going to have to, um, and it, it's what they're finding, their test wells are not showing that uh, it's, it's going to be as profitable as, as they thought it might be, or there's just not enough there. So I think um, those two factors are actually uh, making the situation here a little bit different than what it is in the States, and that um, you know, what they do find they see as, as a benefit to protecting their national security, and um, the fact that there's not going to be as much of it as, as what was initially thought has kind of tamped down that whatever uh, protests were out there. Thank you, Brenda. I have another question here. If I represent a U.S. IT leasing company already registered in Poland, our competitors are the finance arms of IBM and HP, what could we together with the U.S. commercial service uh, that – what could we do together with the U.S. Commercial Service that local sales could benefit from? Well, you know, we we love to help small business, small to medium business. Um, uh, so I think that, you know, if if your competitors are, you know, for instance, IBM, yeah, they're in this market, um, but there's always competitive niches, and I, I think the first thing would be to, to find a local partner um, who could help you, you know, explore those opportunities. Um, we actually do have a really strong uh, IT person <coughs> who um, works in that industry, and she, she knows everybody that's, that's in, the, in the marketplace. Um, I'll be honest with you, we have told people that, you know, maybe this isn't the best market for you. Um, I, I'd say the first step would be just to, you know, tell us tell us about your company. So, uh, fill out a gold key questionnaire, for instance, um, and let's have a talk and see if, if, if it's something that would work in the marketplace. 
Right. And Brenda, I, it looks like um, they're already registered uh, in Poland, but uh, maybe the gold key could be used uh, to find uh, 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 ad additional partners or other kinds of matchmaking for informational uh, purposes for right market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, a lot of times people will register here, and we often have companies who, who try to to go it on their own. And you know, it, it's 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 always, as you know, it's always better if you're working with a local partner who um, you know kind of has a little bit more insights into the marketplace and the you know knows the the people that they're dealing with can speak the language fluently and so on. So. Um, yeah, and you know, we, and we have had situations where maybe the first attempt didn't work out so great. So you know, we'll we'll look again and see if there's another partner that maybe will be a better fit. Hey, Margaret. Yes. Uh, there's a, there's an odd question from the moderator. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, uh, Brenda, you did you did go over the political. Actually, I talked about the president being you know reelected once. That was a good sign. You know, and, and as far as the whole political situation, I mean, there were in the last 25 years or so, maybe the 80s, 90s, I mean, there were certain periods of time, you know, after their freedom or heading towards democracy yeah. that there was where the economy maybe wasn't as stable, and then there was a little bit more afterthought thinking, well, you know, the, the you know, maybe things were better during the communist times. Uh, how is the, how is all that? I mean, there's, it was a little bit cyclic for a while, and how was the, communist sentiment now? I mean, would you think that there is any, is much at all, or, or not That's an issue? That's an interesting question. You know, um, yes, there, there absolutely, there, there still is some, and um, we do still see it, uh, even in, in um, some of the, the parts of government. It, it's interesting. It's, it's rare, but we do still run across it. Um, we run across more people who were in the solidarity movement who are now in positions of power. That's, that's far more common. But, but we do still see some, some communists, uh, I don't, I don't want to say communists, but people who have some of those tendencies. Um, and I would say, and this is, this is purely anecdotal, um, I, I have uh, had conversations with people who are a little bit nostalgic for those times. Um, not many. It's, it's very rare, but it does happen. Uh, because there, well, as one put, person put it, look, we pretended to work and they pretended to pay us. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it, it was different times there, and, and you do see some of that. One thing that, that has really struck me, though, since being here, um, I know that everybody, um, certainly over the age of 35, had to learn Russian in school. They had to. It was mandatory. They didn't have to learn English. Um, that, you know, probably was even frowned upon. Now, I've been telling you all throughout this call how many people speak English here. It's so widespread. It, it, it's everywhere. Um, I rarely, I think in two years, I've heard one person speaking Russian, and that was only because the other person, they, they didn't have a common language. That was their only common language. So they, they used it. No one will speak Russian here. So I, I think that that is more of an indication of where the, the country's sympathies are. Um, they definitely see themselves as more of a, a, a westward-leaning country. They definitely identify more with Western Europe than Eastern Europe. Um, and, you know, they definitely want to be seen as, uh, you know, a free market economy. So I do think that, you know, we have to keep in mind that it's only been one generation um, since the change. So, you know, you're still going to see some of that, but it, it is definitely uh, uh, going away. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Margaret, back to you. Thank you. There is another question, and it has to do with the um, uh, labor unions. Uh, and the question is, as we have heard that in, in the past, especially during the Solidarity Movement, uh, the labor unions have been very strong in Poland. Does this any way affect the businesses that may want to import our U.S. products? Um, you know, I, I keep hearing how strong they are, too. And in fact, uh, there's, there's a little bit in the press this week about uh, that they're calling for a general strike um, in September. But honestly, uh, 
I, I, I don't see it. Um, we do occasionally see protests. Uh, usually they're protesting some um, change in the law or regulations. Uh, there was an issue when the um, retirement age for women was, was changed uh, about a year ago. We saw a lot of protests around that time. But it generally didn't stop the, the work that was going on. I mean, uh, people would be, you know, we saw people walking with signs, but it was on the weekend. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, they were still going to work during the week. So, um, it, you know, I, I hear the term strike, and I often think of, like, France, for instance. They have a lot of, you know, like, one-day wildcat kind of strikes, and, and people will just go out, and it'll, you know, be a they'll hassle, you know, like if the transportation workers all go out on strike, for instance. But in general, you don't really see that in Poland. It, it does tend to be more, um, you know, kind of a weekend sort of thing or maybe something that they'll talk about in the press. But I really haven't seen it as, as hurting business. And I don't know. It, I, I don't want to seem to be like a, a Pollyanna here and just telling you all the good stuff, but I, I really haven't seen any major industries being shut down by, by union organization or, or control. Um, and I think part of that goes to that the polls really do have a, a very strong work ethic. Um, you know, they, they really do want to do a good job. They really do want to, you know, provide a good service or, or product. Um, so I think in general that kind of goes against their nature. Mm -hmm. And and this question is from, from me, Margaret. And just You mentioned the retirement age. What is the retirement age in Poland? Well, it uh, it was 65 for men and 60 for women. Um, but last year that changed because, you know, like so many other economies, the, the, the population is, is staying, they're living longer, and, uh, you know, they, they had some budget issues they had to address. The, so basically they wanted to kind of bring it into line so that men and women would retire at the same time. So now for both groups, um, it's 67, but they're phasing it in. So if you were a woman who was nearing the age of 60, um, it, for the you know, if you turn 60 last year or this year, you still can retire at 60. But you know, if you are 40, uh, you know you, you're going to have to retire at 67. And then there's some varying levels in between that. So if people were getting, if, if you were closer to the retirement age, you, you don't have to work until you're 67. I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and I think it's over a five-year period they're phasing that in. So. It's, it's, there's not an easy answer to your question right now because it depends on where you are in the tier if you're a woman. If you're a man, uh, you know, it, it turned to 67, and that's what it is. Thank you. Interestingly enough, there's, there's actually – my office is working on um, right now an issue that's, that's playing out uh, with their pension system in that um, they had initially brought in – uh, a system that's similar to our uh, 401ks, um, but now they're kind of pulling back from that and trying to go more with just Social Security, and, and uh, that that situation is still in play. We don't know how it's going to work out, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how they handle that problem because right now their their version of Social Security, which is called ZEUS, is actually um, it, it, it's a pay-in, pay-out. There's, there's, it's like a revolving fund. There's no uh, there's no bank there, so they're they're afraid that they may run out of money. So they're trying to address these issues through these manners, through the changing the retirement age and changing the pension. So, <laughs> so be interesting to see how that one works out. I was also curious as to uh, what you you touched on the adopting the euro. Do you think that, I mean, especially what happened the last few years, do you think that they'll ever really go for it? Yeah, personally, I think that they will, only because they are a good citizen of the EU, and I think they want to be seen as a, as a, as a good citizen, a good player, you know, with the rest of the countries. So I, I think it will go to the EU, but I don't think it will happen in the same timetable that it, it was initially planned to. Now take their time a little bit. Yeah, I think that they'll drag their feet a little on it. Sure. And, you know, that's yeah, – I, I do think that they will go to it. Okay. Margaret? No more questions at this time. No more questions. Okay. Hey, well, thank you, guys. I, I appreciate the, the time to be able to talk to you all about Poland. Thank you, Margaret and Brenda. This concludes this program with the reminder to watch our other videos in this series and feel free to contact the U.S. Commercial Service for any further information. Contact information can be found off the main page of export.gov. 
Near the top of the page is a tab for locations. Select domestic or international to find your local office. Thank you.